Well, good morning and welcome to the Royal Cornwall Showground here in Wade Bridge uh, for the Wheels 2010 Festival. My name is Martin, this is my friend Julia, and we're hoping to see some really interesting cars today. Uh, anything you'd like to see, Julia? Well, Martin, I'm hoping to see some lovely classic cherished cars. I think there's plenty of those here today. With maybe some good stories to tell. Oh, I'm sure there will be. And I'm a bit of a mini specialist and fanatic myself, so I'm hoping to make my way up there later. I had heard, yeah. Mm. How about you, Martin? Oh, my cherry secret, I used to have a 1600E Cortina, so I'm hoping to see one or two of those around today. You know, row star wheels, Wabasto sunshine roof, Excellent. aluminium and leather steering wheel. It's my kind of thing. Braid ring starts to fill up with what lots of wonderful vehicles. There's a huge selection of vehicles, including motorcycles and tractors and cars and commercial vehicles and fire engines and all sorts of things. It's just wonderful. The parade will begin at half past two, and your host will be Tim Mitchell, who will be giving a, a short description, I believe, of the cars and vehicles that are in, in the ring. Well, Bella Italia. I'm here with Alancia, all the way from Italy, and its owner is Andy. Hello, Andy. Hello. Andy, would you like to tell me a little bit about this great Lancia? Because apparently it's the only one here like this in the show, am I right? That's right. Um, these were rally cars that were originally made to, to rally. And they's, they won the World Rally Championship six times. So, yeah, it's a proven car. Have you always been passionate about Lancias, Andy? I have. Uh, it's probably my tenth Lancia. So I'm probably a bit of a sucker for rust. <laughs> tenth Lancia. And you do a lot of the work yourself? Yeah, I do a lot of it myself, and any body work my brother does. So, yeah, very good. Good. So, can you tell me a little bit about sort of the enjoyment that you have with your Lancia? I can tell it's beautifully, beautifully looked at. Well, the thing is, it's left-hand drive, so it's a bit more exotic. And because my partner, she sits on the other side of the car, and whenever we go anywhere, a lot of people point at the car, and because they're pointing at her, so she loves that. So. Yes. That's a nice feeling, yeah. It is, definitely. And being red as well, you know, the Ferrari red. Can I ask, does it have a name? It doesn't, I'm afraid, no. So, but it is my pride and joy. I can tell, Andy, lovely. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, and I hope you have many years of enjoying it. Super. Thank you, Andy. Bye-bye. This is a 1936 TA, the MG, very famous sports car, with a lovely little dog in the front, though and a spare wheel in the back. MG's made lovely sports car, they didn't use a lot of horsepower in them, used made them have 100 cc. Well, here's a lovely car. It's it really takes me back to my childhood. I can remember one of my teachers having one of these. And the owner of this splendid car is Dennis Curtis. Good afternoon, Dennis. Hello, boy. And uh, tell us a bit about your car. Well, I've had an, um, I'm a second owner. And I've had them for um, about 28 years. Really? Yeah. That's just you, and you drive it round, this is your regular car? Only in the summer. Only in the summer. <laughs> Any special reason for that? <laughs> Oh, no, no, but i got another one home in the garage, see? Oh, right. Japanese. Ah, oh, right. Well, <laughs> say said. no more about yeah, that. Say, say no more. <laughs> and this, of course, is a venerable split windscreen model. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not so many of these around anymore, are 55. there? 55. 1955. Yeah. I was four years old. Was he really? Yeah. God. <laughs> I bet your father had one, didn't I? Uh, no, do you know, my dad didn't have a car until he was about 38. He had uh, an Austin 
He had a wife instead, didn't he? He had a wife instead <laughs> and four kids, yeah. My wife had one of these, you know. Oh, did her? Yeah, when she learnt to drive, she had a split windscreen Morris Minor. She passed her test on the Friday. She wrote the car off on the Sunday. <laughs> I think it was down the bottom of Gut Hill at St Minver. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know what we do. Yeah. Well, this is a beautiful car. And yeah. you, do you go on trips in it? Not now. No. Oh, no. We have been from um, Land's End to John O'Groats. Really? Uh, and back. And back? Oh, oh yeah. So. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here, would you? No. no. That's astonishing. How long ago was that? Oh, 80 someone. Blimey. I think. Down with the club, see, down with the Cornwall. Oh, right. Cornwall so, Morris Wanger Club. All oh, right, so there were a lot of you eight, there. Eight, nine of us. Do you break down at all? Don't be silly. Not in an English car. <laughs> There you have it. Not in an English car. There aren't too many of those made anymore either. 88 to us. 1988. Land's End to John O'Groats and back again. English car. You saw it here first. <laughs> here we have a traditional car, family car, the old Vauxhall. Lovely colour, lovely condition. I think she might be a woman. I could be proved wrong any minute now. This year, Precious Lives is the main charity for the Wheels event here in Weybridge. I'm with Bob, who's an ex-chairman of the Weybridge Friends Group, who are involved in, in raising money and awareness for the, for the hospice movement in Cornwall. We're currently, the Children's Hospice South West has a special appeal called the Precious Lives Appeal, and we already have two hospices in the South West, and the Precious Lives is devoted to raising money for a Cornish hospice for children specifically in Cornwall who are suffering from um, life-limiting factors. Um, the hospice is being built at Porth Pian, which is near St Austell, uh, Porth Pian in Cornish means Little Harbour, a place of safety, and perhaps it's interesting to know that the hospice is going to be called Little Harbour. It's a place for children who will not grow into old age but have life-limiting conditions. It will be the first one in Cornwall and probably the last one, and it will be built at Porth Pian. As we speak, it's currently under construction and will be open for the first children, hopefully in the spring or summer of 2011. That's wonderful, Bob. How much money has been raised so far? About three and a half million pounds have been raised towards the five million that we actually need to complete the hospice and furnish it for two years. So we are over halfway. We have had a lot of help from Radio Cornwall and from friends groups all over Cornwall. Um, so, and Rotary, the Rotary Club of Waitbridge, has chosen the Precious Lives Appeal as our main beneficiary this year. It means, in effect, that they, the, cl uh, the club will give about half our profits to the Precious Lives Appeal. That's wonderful, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Cool. How about that? Wish I had an engine like that. Well, this beautiful engine in this beautiful car is the property of Mr. Les Cook. Les, How'd good morning. How did you? How long have you had the car? Uh, I finished it in 2007. I've had the car since 1989. I bet it didn't look like this when you got it. No, afraid not, no. <laughs> <laughs> Go on, tell us the story, Les. I bought the car in 1989, uh, drove it until it was falling to pieces, basically, and then uh, started restoring it and finished in 2007. Good heavens, a real labour of love then? Yes. And uh, an awful lot of bits on here aren't original MG Midget bits, are they? Uh, uh, they're, all, they're all MGV parts, but uh, the rocker covers original, but I had it chromed. The carbs are original, but I had them chromed. But most of the panels have been replaced. The engine's original, but it's been uh, rebuilt for unleaded fuel. Uh, I suppose the only reason. This runs on unleaded fuel? Yeah, it's been. Brilliant. Uh, the valves have been hardened. And I suppose really the only original part left on the car from the original is the windscreen. Really? Yeah. I mean, that is an outstanding piece of kit. How does it go? Uh, now, beautiful. This is the only car of its type, the only one. But most things in Cornwall is only a one-off job, you know. Thank you for your lovely bike and the bold down screen. And this is Mr. Mark Chapman driving this car here for today. And the year of this car is 1936. And the type is an Alpine Grand Sport. And it's a really lovely looking car. The lines and the straight six. You can see that it really turned out good cars back then. Got a lovely sound with that old turbo in it. Another John Pangeli, brought from scrap. Rebuilt and converted to a soft top, used every day. That's good. Belonged to Bum Start Mini Club. Nice little mini, well done to bring her back from the scrap each challenge. This is a 1968 Riley Alp, owned by Jeff Brendan Lobb of Fradden. This has got the hydroelastic Easy Ride suspension, the 998 Mini. All original, owned by Mr. and Mrs. Brunfield of Troy, and it's in lovely condition. Is that the daughter in the back? Don't stick your tongue out, love, it's rude. I'm standing here in my favourite spot around these lovely minis. My first car was a mini, and I still have a mini now. Great cars, and this colour attracted me. So I'm interested in talking to the owner of this car, see if he would have a chat with me about the story of this car. Hello, hello. And we have Chris, Chris am I yeah. right? Nice to meet you, Chris. Yeah. Chris, I'm really attracted to your car, the colour, um, the fact that it's de-seamed, and I'd love to know a little bit more about it. Well, the car was bought about three years ago yeah. for about £100, and it was in absolute terrible condition. Mm. There was nothing on the front from the windscreen forward, completely missing. Right. Uh, all the gutters and all the seams on it were completely rotten, yeah. and I did have two minds whether to scrap the vehicle and use it for spare parts but mm. then I thought no I'd, I'll make a bit of a project of it yeah. so the car has been fully de-seamed everywhere all the rust wherever it was was taken out new panels put in mm. it's had new door skins mm. new floors complete new front end um, the engine bays all painted uh, say three years work mm. and you know it's um, it's come out quite nice wherever we take it to always gets uh, attention yeah because I think Mainly the colour draws them in and then when they get closer they see the, the work because I think people do realise how much work goes into these cars. Yes, I'm sure. And the wheels, can you tell me a little bit about the wheels, Chris? Uh, They're interesting. The wheels, uh, basically we bought them second hand and we painted them, colour coded them to the, to the colour of the car, which incidentally is a, a Porsche colour, signal orange. Uh, it just felt like we should have wheels that sort of uh, match the car really. They are period wheels for a period, period modified Mini. Mm. Um, how long have you been passionate about Minis, Chris? Uh, about 25 years. I used to have my own business restoring them. And the, and the future for Minis, they're always going to be a classic car, aren't they, that people they are, are always are. going to love? Prices are very buoyant at the moment. Uh, spares availability is you can get everything from a nut and bolt to a complete body right. shell for them. So everything is available for them. Uh, like I say, collectability, uh, there's so many different models you can choose from, from saloons, vans, pickups. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. you know, for, from an uh, enthusiast point of view, they're the ideal car. Mm. And they're cheap to work on, easy to work on. Mm. 
great stuff. Lovely. Thank you very much, Chris. Well, of course, these boys thought they'd start looking around. Well, they found out on the research on the internet that the gypsies were going to have Trans Am 1979. This is a 6.6 .6 petrol guzzler, very fast though, very slick machine. Doubly done out with the name Bandit from the film, I bet. Yeah, the Bandit's here. Lovely family, of course. And this was very long to the gala. Thank you very much. Lovely car. Lovely bird. That's why give them a round of applause if you're ready. They like that. They bring their cars here for you today, free of charge. Well, oh, here I am with Ian Tatum, who's the owner of this magnificent Green Goddess fire engine. Uh, you'll all have seen these on the telly, used in the fireman's strikes. Uh, originally a military vehicle. Tell us a bit about it, Ian. It was never, in a, never a military vehicle. It was um, built and administered by the um, Auxiliary Fire Service, which was administered by the Deputy Prime Minister, strangely enough. Um, used, uh, built for the use in the Cold War. We were going to be nuked by the um, Russians and these were a part of a water chain and their, their job would have been to transfer water across the country. What's polluted here? A fleet of these across the country joined together, pumping water to supply the country. So they were not originally intended for that? Not originally intended engines. for that, no. But then, then they went into storage and were beefed up and added and turned into rescue vehicles and went into an auxiliary fleet and there were some two and a half thousand of them in storage but now they've all been retired and sold off and uh, the government only have a small fleet of red fire engines now. Right. Auxiliary. This is your one that you bought and I understand that uh, you're looking for something else now, so this yes. is for sale or swap? Yes, I've had this as a, a toy for five years now and I, it's a big toy and I'd like something perhaps a little bit smaller. <laughs> uh, you, you did mention a ferret armoured car? Ferret armoured car would be nice, a fairground ride, a holiday cottage in the Lake District. So there you have it. It's a holiday cottage in the Lake District, or maybe a ferret armoured car. Choice is yours. If you've got one, come and see in here. This is a lovely engine, the Fowler Tiger Tractor Firefly. This was owned by George Hawkins for years. I knew George well. Lovely man, is the Steve. And a lovely extraction of engines. Now his grandson, David, took this engine off. There's a credit to David, he brought her back to life, he's done a few jobs, he's got a sort of leg, she's back on the rally scene with us now. David owned a roller before and he's done it up from scratch, stripped it right in, put it back together, and I think he's done a similar sort of work for this one. And his lovely name, Fire Flies, and this is a showman's engine, he's got the dyno mounted on the front. Here we have the nice pickup there, the 1987 Chevy coming round. I know the owner, Silverado, this is cool. He's a hard friendly model. This is a 6.2 diesel VA, hydro 400 auto box, 14 volt semi floated rear axle. And this thing was made in the USA and perfected. Michael Chester here today, I will be able to sell. Well, here I am standing between these two magnificent lorries with their owner, Malcolm, Malcolm Selwood from Camborne. Right, Malcolm, this is the first truck that you've restored. Would you like to tell me a little bit about it? Yes, um, I bought this truck in 1964 from a breaker's yard. Um, I then, over a few years, I restored it and uh, I began to rally it in 1980. And I bought it because my dad used to run one. Would you like to sit in the cab? Oh, you're quite welcome to. Exciting! Yes, I would love to sit in it. Go. Now, how do you think of it so far, then? Very cosy. Would you like to drive one like this? 
Well, I would love to have a go, but I, I first of all, I'd like to find out what it was originally used for, Malcolm. It was used originally in the Penzance area as a market gardener's truck or lorry, yeah. In 1947 uh, it was new. And what, what power is it? It's a 20, 28 horsepower. I do love driving it. It's, it is fun driving it, yeah. Where are we going, Malcolm? Um, where would you like to go? Let's see, we'll go around the rally field, shall we? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Go. Let's go. Right, one go, okay? We're off. You, you really enjoy this. Wow. What is it? Well, you may well ask. Apparently it used to be a Citroen 2CV, and now it's a Bumblebee. It's, uh, it's a remarkable three-wheel vehicle. Um, on the front here, you can see the evidence of the 2CV with this twin horizontally opposed air-cooled engine. It's incredible. But I don't think I want to go very far in it somehow. I wonder if it still meets the, uh, the traditional French requirement for a 2CV which is that you should be able to take a farmer, his wife, their two children and a tray of eggs across a ploughed field without breaking any of the eggs. What do you think? Right, ladies and gentlemen, here's another Vauxhall, the Vauxhall 10, the 1939. Bought a scene in Winchester, 203. The owner, Nick Edwards, lovely car. Got the dog looking out the front of the corner right here. And this is a three-speeder, lovely feel this time with this sidekick exhaust. Ah, this is a 6 3, yeah. It's a 6 point engine in this one. The big engine, the big block they call this one, wasn't it? Nah, beautiful car, verbal exhaust sound. And this is a manual overdrive. And this is the 40th anniversary of the stack. This car was rebuilt 20 years ago. I'm standing here with Dave, who owns this Thunderbird. Wonderful bike, Dave. Um, it's a Triumph, which is a good, solid English company, isn't it? I'd love you to tell me a little bit more about it. Well, she was born in 1960, and I've had it for nearly 30 years now. We've, the wife and I have done... Um, runs all over the continent with it, Greece, Spain, France, Italy, so they do go well. She's a 650cc twin, um, bog standard from the Triumph factory. This is as you would have bought it. And I hear that this bike has an unusual um, ownership day. Can you tell me about it? Yes, uh, this bike was originally sold by John Surtees, the world champion, um, from his shop in Kent. I didn't buy it from John Surtees, I bought it from the chap that bought it from him, <laughs> if you see what I mean. Yes. But it was originally sold by John Surtees, the road racer, um, who had the shop in Kent. Um, also his father had it before him, so I won't say the bike has got pedigree because it hasn't been raced. Yeah, but it, the shop that it came from has a certain amount of pedigree. It, th this year would have had ivory and black, but you could order it black from the factory. This one has always been black. This is how I've always had it and always run it. Um, I don't know whether your camera can see my sort of jokes on the front, but it will do even now at this age, um, do well in excess of the official speed limit, as if you're brave enough to hang on. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, it did make, amuse me when I saw at the front there, bathtub um, to do with its rear well, end. Can you tell me more? Towards the end of its the life, Triumph were looking for a way to actually get these things for the commuters to buy them. So instead of having the open end at the back, they put this metal bathtub all around the back and enclosed the rear end. And almost immediately it came out, of course motorcyclists being what they are, they said, oh, that's a bathtub. Turn it upside down, of course, and you've, you've more or less got a bathtub. <laughs> Not that you'd have a bath in it, but <laughs> that's how it's got its name, bathtub. And memorable trips on this one, Dave? Any memorable journeys? Yes, we did a, a rally over to France, to the Triton Rally in Rennes. Um, I suppose the biggest 
one that the wife and I ever did. Um, we lived and worked in Greece for 10 years, and I had the bike in Greece, and we rode it home from Greece. So that was a bit of a long way, but we made a, a long trip of it. Instead of coming straight home uh, to England from Greece, we went all day in southern France, visited some friends in the Camargue, and then came up that way. <clears throat> You'll find most of these lads here uh, have been abroad at some time, or they've all, most of us have got some story to tell about traveling farther than you would think on something which is um, 40, 30, 40 years old. It's lovely at 75 with the overdrive box and it's so comfortable when you get out, you still feel quite fresh. Now, a crucial and unique part of Rotary's activities here in Cornwall is the Shelterbox organisation, and I'm here with Philip Cardew, who will tell us a little bit about this operation. Philip. Well, I joined the Rotary Club of Wadebridge in uh, 1999, and I became international chairman very shortly afterwards, and I saw that my first project would be Shelterbox, which was a, a truly international project, which... Um, Certainly all the money went to the particular shelter box operation which is £490 per box <laughs> with all the shelter and subsistence um, equipment needed for a family of ten. What people need immediately is shelter, warmth for sleeping, water initially of course and the uh, method of cooking. We don't supply the food. So really, the clever bit with this is the logistics, the fact that you're able to get these boxes packed and out to the disaster areas so quickly. Yes. I'm happy to say it was a naval man, as I was, Tom Henderson, <laughs> who um, originated the idea, and he has m built up a worldwide uh, organisation. So, for instance, in Haiti, the Rotary Club of Haiti talked to the Rotary Club of Helston, told them exactly what the, the scale of the disaster was and uh, supplied the tents and organisation for it. That's the clever bit about Rotary, isn't it? You yeah. can't make a difference on your own, but when you get mob-handed, you can uh, change the world. Absolutely, yes. You've got it in one. Philip, <laughs> thank you very much. And pleasure. <laughs> Hey, 
This is a stunning Ferguson T20, and this is yours. Yeah. It's in immaculate condition. Um, I'm, I'm a farmer's daughter, and I've got a great passion for tractors, bring lo lots of memories for me. Can you tell me about this lovely, lovely tractor? Yeah, it's a um, 1953 Ferguson petrol TVO is the fuel he runs on, and um, he's 20, 20 horsepower. It's a um, light tractor for raised for mostly for small holders. It's um, used to do most of the work on farms back in its time. You were telling me earlier on that um, when you first started working on the farm, um, there were two tractors like this um, that did all the work. Is that right? Yeah, we, we had 150 acre farm and two tractors the same as this, and they done everything on the farm for the three years I was there. How old is this tractor? He was 1953, so, yeah, 57, yeah, yeah. Well, it's a cracking tractor, Ray. It's lovely and superb condition. Thank you very much for talking to me. That's all right. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome. This is a 1934 Morgan F4, three-wheel chassis and rebuild. It was a 40-year project. This build number is 42, second oldest known example in existence, and the engines were 410 horsepower, side valve. And when new, it was 110 guineas. You know your guineas next to do you? And a lovely, yeah, good car. And Now this is a very unusual Morris Minor, in fact it's very rare, it's the only one in the show, it might be the only one in Cornwall. And here's Leslie Bunny, the owner, to tell us what's different about this car. Les? It's a low light, whereas the others is high light. And, uh, and it was built mostly for the European market, like Australia, and you know, no, South Africa, and Germ um, United States, like, you know. And, uh, why did they stop building them as low lights? Because uh, when they went to America, they said the low lights are too low, oh, and they wanted them up further higher. Those flaming Americans again. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So when they when they started making the, the, the higher ones for the American market, they stopped making these for any market. They did. So yeah. this is very rare then. Les. It is. Yeah. Any idea how many in the country? I don't. There's a quite a few in you know up the country. Yeah? You know, oh. Some in uh, about two in uh, Devon, but. Uh, or, uh, and, but I think that there's only one in Cornwall. It's the only one in Cornwall? Yeah. Tell us a bit about the engine. It's a 918cc side valve. 918cc side valve? That's right. And that differs from the others in what way? Uh, most of those is overhead. Oh right, I understand. So, um, so they sound different as well? That's not right. They sound a bit different? Yes, they're a bit slower. So it's rare and it's sedate? It is. It's a lovely car, Les. Thank you so much for showing it to oh, us. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Here, here we have another Morris, the split screen, a bit different there, earlier one obviously. This car is 1955, that was a good year because I was born then. Everything was good in 55, the split screen Morris, and it's a minor, is it? Yes. The lovely black and the cream, and of course most old cars then, most favourite colour for them to me was black. Well, I'm standing here with Patrick. Um, what a car, Patrick. It's a classic. You must be so proud. Well, I've had it for a very long time, and uh, yes, I'm rather, rather pleased to see it back on the road again. Yes. I know you have a lot of enjoyment with it, Patrick. Would you, would you like to tell me a little bit about it? Well, I first saw it when I got back from Suez in Christmas 56, and I actually bought it on the 7th of January 57. <laughs> And I ran it for about nine years, and then it was getting a little bit tired, and there were children, and they couldn't fit in the back, and so it was put to one side, and I started to take it to bits. And uh, I wasn't very good at putting it together again. No. And 40 years later, I had to get somebody else to do it for me. And it's interesting because I notice on the front of the car there you've got um, photographs of the history of the car, the previous owners, um, the car taken to bits. And what I especially like, Patrick, is the fact that you've got a photograph there of um, the, the children of the previous owners who you actually took the car up to visit. Is that right? That's right, yes. Um, I had, all I had was the logbook and so 
I wrote a letter to the um, local parish magazine with a photograph saying, does anyone know this car? Mm -hmm. And about three weeks later, the telephone went one evening and that was the son, uh, Michael Allen, saying it's my father's car and it all went from there. Right, what a story, what a story. And their reaction when they saw it? Um, well, they, he, he was actually a Triumph man himself and he came down under a Triumph stag from Kent to Cornwall and saw the car and then I went from Cornwall up to Kent and uh, visited him and his sister. Yes, yes. What a wonderful story. And, uh, and the it, original owner was then about 92 and he died. So he, ne he never got to see his old car, but his two children did. Yes. And the badges on the front of the car, Patrick, can you tell me a little bit about those? Um, RAC Motorsport was just, if you were a competition licensed member or something, um, the Ulster Automobile Club used to run rallies in Northern Ireland. The Circuit of Ireland was their big international rally, which I actually never took part in because of the slight outburst of the troubles that year. Probably a good thing because it was pretty high-powered stuff. Yes. Lovely. Well, thank you for sharing that with me, Patrick. I can imagine myself as Grace Kelly sitting in that one, <laughs> enjoying every moment. I wish you would. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Gentlemen, here we have the lovely MGA. So this will be a straight four cylinder with twin cars. Our three owners from new, and the model for gallon is roughly 20. And they are quite good on fuel, aren't they? And a good handling car, but I mean, this was one of the first in 59 with a straight 1593 engine. Well, we've had a wonderful day here at the Royal Cornwall Showground. All good things must come to an end. We've seen some amazing vehicles. And we've met some lovely people. Yes, we have. Well, it's time for us to go now, so it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye. goodbye.